Hello everyone, welcome to lecture number one. In this lecture, I want to discuss assignment seven, and in particular, I want to talk about the difference between story and argument, and how to make them work together. Your thesis statement for the essay, and other ideas for deciding on what your argument is. The importance of knowing who your audience is, who you're talking to, and rhetorical appeals. First, I think it's important given our current situation, to think a little about stories in general. We have read and written and talked a lot about stories in this class through a variety of forms and genres and through a variety of topics related to climate change. One of the most important insights I hope you'll think about through these last two assignments is the tension between what we might call stories we inherit and stories we create. That is, you all have stories that you grew up with um, from your families and friends and the where and when of your life. Many of these are stories that you don't get to choose. They are, in fact, given to you. In this class, you've been asked many times to tell your own story by taking stories you've inherited and doing something different with them that matters to you. We might think of this as Chi does, as um, what he calls hacking a myth. Um, an excellent story or example, uh, uh, a story example of inheriting but also choosing stories uh, can also be found in Rising Tides in the piece from McGregor and McGregor which I'd like to read a small uh, series of selections to you from. I'm reading from All Our Relations, Climate, Changing, Climate Change Storytellers by Deborah McGregor and Hilary McGregor, which starts on page 125. I'll be reading selections from 127, 128, and 129. The piece opens with the description of the dream that the narrator's son has had, and instead of trying to explain it for him, the narrator offers a story of their own as a way to advise them. The spirit's call to action has him troubled. That responsibility to act, what can one person do? It is not my dream to interpret, that work still has to be done. So instead I tell him the story of the pipe and eagle. The version relayed by Anishinaabe elder Edward Benton Benai in the Mishomis book. In this story, despite teachings of how to coexist with the rest of creation and the gifts given to remind us, the Opwagan, Ode Egan, Sema, of how to live, the people have become vain and unkind, and we begin to hurt each other and abuse our other rel relatives. The teaching of peace, humility, and generosity are forgotten, and the gifts are used to advance our own personal power. The Creator is upset about the abuse of the gifts that were provided to support all life. A spirit was to be sent to destroy the earth after four days. On the fourth day, just before the sun rises, Migizi, eagle, calls to the Creator at Bidaban, at daybreak. There is already light that very spiritual time when it is no longer night, but not yet day. The eagle cries four times to get the Creator's attention and petitions to spare the lives of all the people and the unborn. The unborn, the eagle said, can learn from the humble few who still follow the instructions to live in harmony with the earth. It is the unborn that provide hope for the future and for people to correct their ways. The eagle is thus entrusted with the responsibility to fly over the earth each day to find at least one good person who continues to live according to the principles of Mino Bi, uh, Mino Bima Dizawin, living well with the earth, a good life, and report back to the creator his observations. One day, the eagle seeks that one person or family about whom he can report back to the creator so that life on earth can be spared. The narrator goes on and then reflects. It is easy to become disheartened with climate change and other environmental crises threatening life as we know it. But then I remember the eagle, who needs to find only one person to petition on our behalf so life will continue. So, year after year, my family continues Gi Mis Hyang to receive from Aninatig, that's maple trees, as we continue to nourish our spirit and pray that Migizi, the eagle, can find us. The narrator concludes... Stories about what is happening now and what will happen soon are being told every day, every minute, by the earth itself. We have failed to remember the storytellers of the natural and spiritual worlds. 
we have failed to listen to dreams, visions, and intuition. We need to remember that it is with humility that we must breathe life, breathe life into our responsibilities and obligations to the continuance of life. We have to act on the stories being told by the earth. While it is often the voice and experience of the most humble that escapes our attention, we, like Eagle, must seek those who continue to support life. If we were in class together after reading this piece, I would ask you all, what do you notice in this piece that we've read about what the author thinks about the power of story? In particular, which stories do we listen to more than others, and which stories have more influence upon us? Who is involved in the creation of this story? I notice many actors, uh, both human and non-human, and the earth itself. There's many here. But perhaps most importantly, what do the authors tell us about the relationship between story and action? This relationship in particular is what I encourage you to think about in both this assignment 7 and the final assignment through your reflection. But where to start? Uh, what I want to talk about now is the story versus the argument and how we might make them work together. In assignment 7, you are being asked to choose a story and an argument that are mutually complementing each other. If we keep uh, this uh, story or nonfiction piece, all our relations in mind, what is a story that you could tell that holds inside of it an important argument that you want to make, something that persuades the reader to action or to reflection? Picking a story isn't easy, but I encourage you to choose one that allows you to show us something uh, that you can tell us about your thinking through the argument. That is, pick a story that offers opportunities to feel, to think, and that you can explain through your argumentative writing. For example, I, it's important to notice how Chi gives, uh, often in his essays, a short introductory part of the story, something to set the scene, or the tone, or the, the, the heart of the argument and the story, and then goes on to explain um, what the larger issues might be that the story reflects. I encourage you to first choose a story, maybe something you've already written about in this course, and then mine it for suitable argument. If you are stuck, however, by starting the story, then I suggest you decide first on an argument and then pick a relevant story that provides a way in for the readers. It might be helpful to look at an example. Um, one story to think about that I really enjoy is Cheese the Rosary. And in this way, I think sometimes we can think of an argument as not so much as really trying to persuade people over a contentious issue one way or the other, but perhaps more about how to offer recommendations uh, that you are sure might be a benefit to us, especially, for example, in the current and trying times that we live in where, you know, climate and disease and disasters are on the horizon or, in fact, very much in front of our faces. In the Rosary, Chi is asking us to rethink our relationships to non-human life, and particular through the practice of gardening and roses. Uh, and also to think of how instead that human beings may not be the gardeners, but uh, that we might indeed some learn something quite the opposite. I just want to read a few very short passages, uh, beginning on one page 56, and then the very last page of the, of the essay. On 156, after the break, she says, Roses, I discover in my research, appear delicate, but have adapted to most climates. They can be made to bloom all through the year until winter. The more they are cut back, the faster they grow, and the stronger they are. My role models at last, I think, when I read this. This is a theme throughout both um, what the roses teach him, um, but also how they speak to him as messengers. And on page one, uh, 70, uh, oh, never mind. I'm back. On page 169, after having left for a writing retreat for about a month, and after having cut the roses back fairly, uh, way too far in the spring, she is nervous about returning home to them. At the bottom of one page six, 
169, he says, When I return to my garden, the roses I feared would be dead or dying are instead huge, the canes thick and new, the leaves a sturdy dark, and the buds firm to the touch. I can feel them surging under the surface. My cutting them back by two-thirds would seem to have made them more powerful than ever. Perhaps it was the gift of the snake. Uh, he had found a snake skin by a snake that had been uh, sunning itself outside of where he was staying. The lesson for me, at least, and this I think of as the gift of the garden, learned every year I lived in that apartment. You can lose more than you thought possible and still grow back stronger than anyone imagined. On page 171, he wraps up these thoughts. I had come to this garden much like what I had found in it. I was a mess, a disaster in need of a reckoning. That backyard was my perfect mirror, and the dream of the garden was in its own way a dream of myself. I arrived there after many years of self-abandonment, sure only that I did not know myself, but certain that I needed to believe I had a future. I did not know what the garden could do, and did not know what I could do. If my garden was a messenger, the message was in the silent moments when I was sure I could hear it growing toward me through the earth. That more was coming. But I did not know this then. I knew only that it was time for me to leave. I had done what I had came to do. Whenever I am back in the neighborhood, I sometimes pass my apartment from the street. I like to believe, stupidly, that if I were to open the front door again, in the back I would find my roses, huge from their seaweed tea and the many days of six-hour sunlight, perhaps growing legs, ready to push down the building and walk out to the street, striking cars out of their way and slicing the blacktop to ribbons. I want to think that they would miss me, their erstwhile tormentor, the one who pushed them so hard to grow, cutting and soaking them in the blazing sun from spring to winter, from the street, from across the river, where I live now without them, I can feel them still, the sap pulsing in their veins, pushing their way to the sky. But the creature that grew legs and walked away from the garden was me. I was not their gardener. They were mine. In this way, we learn about the ways in which roses are far more resilient than Cheek would ever have known as a novice gardener. Uh, that there's a long history of their role as messengers, that they can tell us a number of different things, they speak to us, but also that they can be role models. Um, in fact, as Chi says, uh, they are the gardeners of us more than we are of them. Uh, as in the piece All Our Relations, this essay by Chi asks us to consider how we are as much shaped by the world as we shape it, if only we might pay attention to the non-human world um, and offer it that attention and respect. Uh, the earth is indeed telling climate changing stories every day. Um, what I think is useful for all of you is I bet she knew his five years with his rose garden did indeed hold a story. Um, and he tells us about his diary keeping and his modes of reflection and the larger pieces of his life that frame the five years in that apartment um, through this essay and others. But it was only likely through some uh, reflection and time spent meditating upon his time with the roses, um, only after the fact that he was able to add argument and persuasion and structure it in the form of an essay. And again, you'll notice here that he does it in a way that offers us uh, stories pieced out through the seasons, through his planning, through his initial vision, dreams about the garden, the research that he does about it. Um, and while I don't expect any of you to create essays this you know, sweeping, um, he's been doing this a lot longer than any of us. Um, I encourage you to think about what is the way that your story can provide a structure to your argument? Can it be broken up into small pieces that then allow you to build your argument? Is there an order that makes sense? Maybe it's not straightforward linear through time. Maybe it starts uh, at the end of the story and then works its way through again. Um, those are the choices you have to make. Um, however, if you're stuck and aren't sure about the story to begin with, I think that it is also useful to start from the argument um, that you can think of an issue around climate change that is important to you and uh, think about what are the sides of this issue? Uh, what are they? Which side are you on? Are you trying to sway a group? Um, 
especially one that is very much against you? Or are you trying to encourage a group uh, who might already agree with you to do more? For example, I feel like many of Chi's essays, while he might be writing to those who disagree or would dismiss him, often he's telling uh, those of us who are already a bit on side with him something that maybe we need to hear. Either way, uh, what I encourage you to do to make it uh, simple for you to accomplish this assignment is to write one simple sentence that clearly states your position and as something that you can hold on to. This will be a kind of compass for you as you write, and any time you are stuck or get lost, you can go back to the thesis statement and ask, does this part of the story, does this paragraph, does this page um, build and support and help me uh, grow my argument uh, for my thesis? Again, as always, if you are struggling, I really encourage you to reach out to Alex and I, um, especially if you have a thesis statement you can send ahead of time, um, and maybe even just a brief description of the story you're thinking that might match up. We're happy to talk over email or phone, but um, those are places to start, either with the story or the thesis statement, though I encourage you to try doing both. Next, in terms of audience, uh, I'd like to read you the final page of Chi's collection. In the essay on becoming an American writer, uh, which I know that you've already read with Kate, I really feel that because he uh, struggles in this essay to explain to us what is the point of writing, particularly after the election of Trump, who he takes pains not to name, um, what is the point and what is its power? And so I'm sharing this with you both, uh, I hope, to help you for assignment seven in terms of thinking about who you're writing to. But um, also, and as you'll see in further uh, lectures that I'll post, I want you to be thinking about how you reflect and how reflection can be a powerful resource to you, especially in a time like this where we're all struggling in different ways, uh, to find ways to tell your story that can be empowering and can give you hope. On page 277, she writes, I have new lessons in not stopping after the election, in quotes. If you are reading this, and you are a writer, and you, like me, are gripped with despair, when you think you might stop, speak to your dead, write for your dead, tell them a story. What are you doing with this life? Let them hold you accountable. Let, let them make you bolder, or more modest, or louder, or more loving. Whatever it is, but ask them in. Listen, and then write. And when war comes... And make no mistake, it is already here. Be sure you write for the living, too, the ones you love, and the ones who are coming for your life. What will you give them when they get there? I tell myself I can't imagine a story that can set them free, these people who hate me. But I am writing precisely because one did that for me. So I always remember that, and I know to write even for them. I am, it should be said, someone who did lose his faith. I may, in fact, be pus <laughs> pusillanimous. I, even I can't say that word. Look it up. Even as a condition of my faith in myself, and at times I despair. I do not write as much as I should, and I do not always think that when I die I will have the chance to see my dead again. But for now, I live and work, and I feel them watching me. And so I leave this here now for them and for you. If you're struggling, again, with the argument and the story, I think a really good way to narrow it and focus it is to do as Chi asks, and or demands of us, really, and ask, who are you trying to remember? Who are your dead that are important that you should be listening to, thinking of as you write? And who are those who are still alive that you love and care about, that through writing a personal essay that you'd want to support? But also, and equally importantly, who are you trying to sway or persuade that might disagree or even violently oppose you? Knowing who your audience is, very much like what we did with the letter, but this is for larger groups of people, um, is a really important and effective way to narrow the scope of your argument and make the storytelling more effective. Uh, in this way, this really easily leads to a next and important question, that once you have a sense of an answer to these questions, who are you writing for, who are you writing to persuade or perhaps against, you should ask yourself what sort of appeals through writing might work the best for different audiences. And this leads us to one of my last points, the rhetorical appeals of logos, ethos, and pathos. 
I did cover this a bit with some of you who came to the last class on Friday the 13th, um, but I wanted to cover it again for those who were not there. Uh, these are Greek terms that come from Aristotle and, and other scholars. Uh, many cultures through time have different relationships to this idea of the essay or speeches and how to persuade and appeal to people. Logos is the idea of your appeal to reasonable argument, uh, logic, the facts, and reason. Ethos is about uh, ethics. This is about building your credibility and authority as a speaker or author and ways to reach people in terms of what is fair. Pathos is about emotion. This is about how you make people feel. So these are the three things I want to see in the essay. Um, and one is already a freebie. I'll mention later about the, you know, adding secondary sources, but adding other people's, other authorities, uh, evidence or facts or claims to your uh, essay is already building your logical appeal because you are relying on other authorities, other experts to help support your argument. So really, as you're writing, you need to think about what makes you credible, in, and part of that will be through you telling your own story, but also what kind of emotions. And again, thinking ahead as you're sketching out your essay before you write it about what, what particular emotions are you trying to make a person feel will really help you narrow and focus and more easily write your essay. Um, a couple examples might help. In class, we talked about Greta Thunberg from the very beginning of term. If we look at the appeals of her writing, um, she uses a lot of climate science, um, and this would be an appeal to logos, but it would also be a kind of appeal to uh, credibility and authority. As a child, as a very young person, it's very difficult for her to claim credibility and authority for certain people, um, but this is one way she does so. She uses uh, ethos or ethics uh, to talk about who is going to bear the brunt of the uh, violence and devastation of climate change. She appeals to the sense that there are those who did not have a hand in the creation of climate degradation, but will have to bear the greatest weight of it. This is, I think, an ethical but also emotional appeal. Um, but also she uses uh, emotions like anger and putting guilt and shame on others, and I think, and also a kind of sorrow. So these are more or less effective. We talked about this a lot at the beginning of class. Um, so that's one person to think about. She writes in a very particular way, and she has these in mind as she writes. Um, Trump, unfortunately, is another uh, example. Uh, his uh, logic is not really there unless you believe in conspiracy theories. He rambles a lot. It's very hard to follow him. And yet, he makes himself an, as an authority, often through uh, lying or making ridiculous claims, and some people buy this, and because he's the president, he is able to say whatever he wants and still hold authority. Position also is part of your credibility. Uh, but emotionally, we talked about in class how his go-to emotion, his emotional appeal, is always through fear. Fear of other people, fear of disease, fear of doing something that... Uh, he is not in favor of. He always is using fear to prey upon people's insecurities in order to persuade them. He doesn't use uh, common sense. He doesn't use compassion. He never uses care or empathy. Um, he doesn't think about other people. He thinks about himself, and that's from the place in which he acts and persuades. Um, so that's something to think about in terms of two very polar opposites. Um, one thing to think about if you're looking for other examples would be look in the current media as people are writing about coronavirus, uh, what kind of emotional appeals seem to be there in terms of politicians asking us all to stay home or um, the ways that media, you know, generates discussion about, you know, who's to blame depending on what kind of media you're reading, something to think about. Uh, I'll wrap up here uh, just to say something about secondary sources that, um, Alex has already posted some really excellent tutorial clips on the channel, and I really encourage you to, uh, to, to uh, watch them and listen and uh, follow her instructions there about the library and about, about uh, doing citations through MLA. Um, I really recommend you start there if you're feeling lost. I just will add that I wanted to encourage you to use sources that support your argument, um, but to do so in ways that maybe your story can't. Your story should um, sort of provide a colorful, engaging, emotive, descriptive backbone to your argument. It's really the meat of the essay. Um, but think about the secondary sources not as like a lot of extra work you have to put in to weave them in, uh, but more uh, how can you fill in potential holes in your ability to persuade people 
Maybe your story isn't able to hit all the boxes. You'll notice even in the rosary, uh, Chi is using different gardening books, uh, other people who've planted roses, the history of roses, uh, scholars, monks, all kinds of different people who have had relationships with them. And he does that in a way to be able to show that there's a larger history about roses that have been going on far, far longer than any of us have been around. Um, and in that way, he's able to really build his credibility to show that he did a bit of his homework. So I encourage you to think about the secondary sources in that way. Um, a pro tip, if you are uh, struggling to uh, get enough sources or not sure which ones to use, sometimes it can be useful to use a source that gives uh, the other side of the argument that maybe you're not in favor of. And this can, if used really judicious, ju judiciously and correctly, can build your credibility. That's, again, ethos. Um, as the reader will see that you are at least trying to see the other side of the argument. This isn't necessary, but it's just an idea if you're stuck. Uh, finally, please don't spend too much time with the secondary sources. Again, this is just to show that you looked around to see what the state of your particular argument and that conversation is in the world, and to show the reader that you've done some of that homework and that you have enough credibility to talk about it. Not, you know, personal experience will only get us so far. Uh, I hope this lecture was helpful to you, and I am sorry that it's a little late. Technology is not my number one strength. Uh, if you need any help, again, please do reach out to us. Um, we're thinking about all of you and wishing you that wishing that you are as well as you can be during these uh, troubling and difficult and often humbling times. I hope you're all staying safe out there, and I look forward to seeing you in lecture two.